did a program. We had to make note of the fact that Elsa was back in town. She's yes. wonderful, you know. And uh, welcome, welcome very much to a conversation. Pleasure to welcome to the program a legendary figure, particularly in the Lower East Side of New York City, and that's Clayton Patterson, documentarian extraordinaire and an artist and a person who's very, very busy and been doing a great deal of work we're going to catch up on. And Clayton, it is overwhelmingly pleased to welcome you to the program. Well, it's been a real pleasure, Harold. We've known each other certainly since uh, the 80s, and yeah. uh, I'm always uh, appreciative to be here, and it's always good to see you. And yeah. Um, yeah, I have been busy, actually. I've been, uh, you know, working on the books, of course. Right. I've uh, okay. finished two already. One mm -hmm. is called uh, Resistance, a Radical Political Social History of the Lower East Side. Really important, yeah. And the other one is called Captured, a film video history of the Lower East Side. Uh -huh. And both of those books were published by Seven Stories Press. Great press, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great press. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I'm working on a, uh, the next uh, volume, which actually could be three volumes, because it's about probably about 2,500 pages now. It's about uh, Jewish history of the Lower East Side. Wonderful. Yeah. I got into the whole business of, uh, of sort of, I guess I'm kind of lucky because I'm older. Yeah. And so I have a large archive and a lot of artwork and a large body of work, so I can start looking backward. But it's really unfortunate for the people that are coming up uh -huh. because New York is no longer the art capital of the world. I mean, the whole, um, the muse has left. Really? Absolutely. You, and, yeah. you know, the genius of New York, it doesn't matter whether you, uh, it's all attached to cheap rent, basically. And what, what, what is attached to cheap rent? Uh, the, the, the genius muse, uh, or, or the artistic expression? Uh, uh, or? Well, not only artistic. You mm. could say, not saying he's a genius, but even Rudolph Giuliani mm -hmm. and, and Ed Koch grew up with cheap rent, as probably uh, Bloomberg did. Uh -huh. But, you know, whether it be Jackson Pollock or Rothko or Allen Ginsberg or uh, Charlie Parker, Charlie Mingus, anybody you can mention that really that made these huge contributions yeah. to America were yeah. all attached to cheap rent. Okay. Like you could look at uh, Lou Reed was living on uh, Ludlow Street in the 60s and he was paying $35. Right. And so right. and kind of, you know, him going in and out of, you know, getting better, getting worse, singing his songs, whatever, the, the trials and tribulations that he faced, uh, he was able to go through really because of cheap rent. So he's mm. paying $38. Now, across from Katz is the new building there. It costs you three thousand dollars for a studio, okay. so you can't be an artist. You can't be a writer. Three thousand dollars a month. Three thousand dollars a month. It's incredible. Yeah. It's insane, mm -hmm. and so it means that you can't really be an artist in the city because before you used to have the ninety-nine cent breakfast, two eggs, toast, yeah. coffee, pan fries, yeah, orange yeah. juice, mm -hmm. and that would keep you going for most of the day. And yeah. you know your rent was cheap, so you could be an artist. You could develop your ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, you just don't start off doing drip pan paintings like Jackson Pollock, and three weeks later you're in a gallery making a million dollars. It yeah. takes years to develop yeah. and get people to understand what you're doing because ideas that are ahead of the curve take a long time for people to catch up to the idea. Exactly, and artists tend to be ahead of the curve. And of, ten of the of race, course. I think Pond called them, you know, they are. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's one of the purposes of creativity is breaking the mold that's here, yeah. and then you create a new uh, frontier, a new vision, and it takes people a long time to catch up to the, what you're thinking. Well, I still think of the Lower East Side as a cauldron of great artistic no, expression. No, no. You're saying, you're, Now, listen, not. this is from... Uh, person who has been adequate or appropriately dubbed the mayor of the Lower East Side. I think it's fair to say everyone in the Lower East Side knows you and you're a figure and you read the pulse of that area and you're telling me my view of the Lower East Side that I had when Allen and so forth was around is gone? Oh, it's gone. It's dead. It's uh, it's finished. You could never have a CBGB's again. Yeah. I mean, CBGB's, uh, you know, the great contribution it made, certainly late 70s into the early 80s, was all about, you know, uh, Hilly having the time and, and the low rent to experiment with, uh, and, and bands spending the time to get their chops to, you know, to get everything up to speed. You can't right. do that now. Now it's like the you know cheapest rent you can get is fifteen hundred dollars, yeah. and you got to work hard and all the time to be paying that rent, and you can't be paying the rent, paying the rent, paying the rent. And why? Doing the art. Why did that transformation take place? I mean, why is there? Why are there not political forces that would address it? We used to have West Beth. We had places where they set aside things for artists, realizing the artistic expression is not recognized in our culture as of re much relevance compared to the economy as a whole. So why has this society gone such through such a transformation, uh, and how do we get it back? If money, we money and greed. Money and greed. It's all, right. all, it's all only Hasn't about the money. Hasn't there always been money and greed and so forth yes, by the fathers, always, of town fathers? 
of course, but there was always that uh, large place for the people. The people's yeah. place now is missing. Now it's corporate and it's money. Like if you take the Lower East Side, the other great thing about the Lower East Side is you had this mixture with the immigrants. Yeah, absolutely. Now when you have an immigrant population, you have the whole cross-section of, of the people. You go from the genius to the idiot. Okay. So struggling to get out of that cauldron are mm -hmm. people like Houdini and mm. uh, you know Emma Goldman, yeah. and Dorothy Day, and you know all of yeah. these really great, right. great people. Right. Well, we can't have that anymore. You know, you, you can't have that population down there struggling to survive because you're paying too much money now. You know, like when did in a qualitative way that transformation come to effect? What year are we talking about? Because well, Alan hasn't been gone all that long. And you could uh, actually sort of start in a way. I mean. If you follow, like the book, for example, Resistance, in a way, yeah. it kind of started off with Nixon after the, um, you know, the riots in the inner cities and things like that. Then yeah. this concept, which actually a word was uh, developed at that time, called spatial deconcentration, okay. which meant taking the population from the inner city and mm. spreading it out because that was like a power to cake. They uh -huh. saw, they saw, you know, you know, political implications. Yeah. Yeah, just like that artistic uh, creativity yeah. can build a bomb, that energy of uh, people that are being repressed can build a bomb. So uh -huh. they decided, okay, well, we're going to try to spread all that out. Then you get to like Moynihan, and then you got uh, <coughs> uh, plant shrinkage. So you mm -hmm. start taking out all the inner city uh, uh, facilities and like that. And then by the time you get to '79, we've actually hit the bottom. '79. Koch comes in as mayor, and then we start. Reagan this comes in as president. Reagan comes in as pre president, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. And that who and that whole new economy starts mm -hmm. coming in, and the march upward starts, and this whole force of gentrification starts becoming more obvious. You know. Uh -huh. You had during Koch, you had all of the uh, SROs were all being emptied out. Remember that in the 80s, yeah, uh, yeah. all the condos yeah. and all these people ended up being homeless on the street. It wasn't just that they were filled with people that had nothing to do and were no good nicks. You and I met or along about the time of the Tompkins Square business, right? right? You were photographing the police and that kind of stuff in Tompkins Square. So you went from taking these SROs and converting them into condos and co-ops, which then started really escalating and exploding on the Upper East Side. Then you started getting on the Upper West Side. Then you started getting Balducci's up there. It used to be like Murder Row in the 80s, and mm -hmm. then all of a sudden it became gentrified. Yeah. So you get to the point where, um, you know, and then what happened, actually, Dinkins really made one of the greatest contributions, and he's always uh, neglected, and everybody sort of looks down on him, but he really was the person who caused one of the greatest changes because after I did a, a videotape in 1988 that became known as a Tompkins Square Park police riot. I remember. And it was called the police riot because especially if you watch it nowadays, you can, it's obvious that the police rioted. They were totally out of control. You could mm. have the white shirts chasing the blue shirts down the street. Nobody mm. was following orders. There mm. was no chain of command. Now that tape caused, a, a, and I think there was somebody national uh, from a federal level that got involved in that because Koch couldn't really deal with the police. So somebody from an oversight had to have come in and they started restructuring the police. It took about uh, four years, from 88 to 92. Uh -huh. And that happened under Dinkins. Dinkins then started building up the police. But one of the greatest things that Dinkins did was to uh, create the Mullen Commission. Uh, okay, so spell uh, it out. The uh, Mullen Commission was M-O-L-L-E-N, yeah. was about cleaning up the corruption in the NYPD. Wow, okay. And that's when you started getting the Morgue Boys and Michael Dowd and his sleazy crowd. Mm -hmm. and. You know, all of those drug dealing cop uh, gangs within the police department. Well, once yeah. they started chasing that out and cleaning that up, the police department got organized. Mm -hmm. So you have to remember, in 1988, they couldn't close a 10 and a half acre park on the Lower East Side. You mean there's Tom 450 Square. cops yeah. and more couldn't, co couldn't close that park and control the streets. Uh -huh. 2001, they could close in two hours every bridge, subway, uh, uh, tunnel, airport, uh, bus, street. You know, from 24th Street below, you had a cop in every corner. In order to get onto your block to the next block, you had to show ID. And what year? That's the difference. In, what year in 2001. You after, mean remember after, after the, September 11th? After September the 11th, yeah. they shut this whole city down in two hours. Mm -hmm. Subways, they got their act together. Buses, yeah, they got. The, and that started with Dinkins. And it started with cleaning up the police department. Dinkins understood if you don't control the streets, you don't control the city. Yeah. The they, city and the streets are, you know, you have to control the streets in order to control the city. They've always been worried about riots by the underclass. Let's say for one of another term, but the, in a new kind of dimension, maybe they're worried about a real explosive kind of thing that could happen. Well, I think it was a consciousness of understanding that if we want to control the city and, and, and if we're going to make this into a vital city and an economic capital of the world, we have Wall Street and whatever, we better be able to control the streets. And Dinkins is the one. You see, everybody gives credit to Giuliani, but yeah. by the time Giuliani, Giuliani got into Giuliani power, time, yeah. but by the time Giuliani got into power, Dinkins gave him the ability to control the streets. He mm -hmm. gave them a disciplined, well-organized, razor-sharp paramilitary organization. Mm -hmm. 
the other thing that the riot changed was is that the police department changed the mentality and the philosophy of the police department they changed it into a paramilitary model okay that, that's going on larger templates too that's posse comitatus is under attack i think and, well let uh, me tell you when yeah. i saw columbine mm -hmm. what shocked me you know this mm -hmm. little you know um suburban, obviously it was a tragedy but yeah. yeah all of a sudden these police department in this small suburb in the middle of colorado mm -hmm. a suburb in the middle yeah, of colorado right. had this whole police department that came on this task force that looked like New York City Police Department. Right, that's same that look, tough. same yeah, uniform. Yeah, yeah. So that also meant that consciousness is national. Yeah. Uh -huh. So anyway, by this time you control the streets and and then in order to get rid of the drugs, mm -hmm. rather than just trust NYPD, which they didn't, still mm -hmm. even at that point, mm -hmm. is it became a, 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 a three-pronged task force. You had state, like when busts now were starting to happen in the uh, Lower East Side, mm -hmm. you would have in the late 80s, uh, by the time you get to Dinkins, and then certainly Giuliani, you had federal, state, and NYPD in on these major busts. All in tandem. Yeah, yeah no yeah. longer pressure point where mm. it was just the New York City Police Department where they yeah. kind of cleaned the streets, but all the drugs and everything were still there. Mm. They changed it. Mm. And then this huge money, then all of a sudden you stabilize the neighborhood. Uh, um, so the bankers move in. Bankers and, and the university, NYU. Oh, yeah, so big time in Columbia big uptown. Big time, yes. Yeah. So now you have in this neighborhood that was completely saturated with drugs and everybody was happy that the drugs were gone because now everybody thought we were going to have a free and good and stable uh, neighborhood. It's not going to do you much good if you're paying two thousand dollars for a studio apartment which nobody can afford uh, given the fact that artists get deadly squat three thousand in terms of the society. Three. Three thousand. But you know let's forget yeah. the artist for a minute. Okay. okay. Let's say you go to Columbia University and you want to be a journalist. Yeah. So now you're going to an Ivy League university. You're mm -hmm. in a graduate program. You've got people like President Gore there uh, uh, teaching classes. Uh-huh. And you graduate. Well, you know, when you start off as a journalist, you're usually working for, uh, you know, small newspapers. Right. You have to get your chops. Yeah, right. Sure. So you like for, anything. Like anything. Mm. So you work for the villager at $50 a story. Right. New York Times is a freelance, $150 mm. a story, mm. maybe $200 a story. And you're working for the New York Times. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so you get one story a week. That's $150. You get one story every week if you're lucky. Mm. Well, that's $600 a month. Mm -hmm. mm, not a big dent in your $3,000 uh, a month uh, studio apartment. Right, right. So we're not just talking about artists because people aren't, aren't that sensitive to artists. We're talking about almost everything that a person wants to, you know, start off in the bottom and work their way up in, uh -huh. whether it be journalism. I mean, even as a doctor, I'm sure a lot of doctors don't. Police department, doesn't matter what you're in, you can't be paying $3,000 for a studio apartment. And we're talking the Lower East Side now. We're not talking the most expensive neighborhood in the city. We're not talking, they're selling now lost for $48 million. Yes, 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 yes. So yeah, who are we yeah. talking about? So let's Put the artist aside for a minute. Let's okay. let's, let's talk well, about any middle class kid that wants to come here and do uh, anything. All right, yeah. he can't do it. Yeah, because of the high rent. Because of the high rent and gentrification, which is all the same. Now, if the society were adequately organized, let's say in the way w maybe the future requires and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, if they're going to have something like that developing, then there would have to be the income to the folks, to the people, adequate to meet the needs of a well organized personal and a uh, civil life for the for everybody rather than it just being for the few people at, at the top of the society well we differ a little bit by the, about that because okay. you, you you see it as an outside source sort of uh, maintaining and taking care of the people and i see it as the person should be able to be independent and make it from themselves well if everybody had an income adequate to what is required by the market then everybody would be in a certain sense independent but as it stands now, you've got a few people owning all the assets, the gentrified few and so forth. Plutocrat, it's a plutocracy, it's not an economic democracy. And we're all working on either institutions whose templates are set up by those who have that power, and we're like serfs on a feudal estate. Yes. Uh, it's close to chattel slavery. It's not chattel. Absolutely. No, but you understand right. what I'm saying? So we shouldn't talk about democracy for the vast majority of people. They're in institutions that are outer-directed uh, kind of things, uh, top-down authoritarian, and that's right. the way the society is organized. And the income uh, growth is all going to the few at the top, and the people are being marginalized. And the, middle, the road yeah. into the middle class is being cut out for a great number of the people oh, and maybe the creating class. forget the middle class the well middle the middle class exist. are part or the upper middle class or the middle class are the people who are going into those gentrified venues because they're an investment banking house or something where they make a great deal of well, money see, and that's it's just the point is that you have to be working for somebody for see we differ in in matter of approach here because you know 
um, those are two major differences. You know, you see it as uh, government or somebody else guaranteeing an income for everybody. And well, I, that wouldn't be a bad idea. That would be one way to do it. A lot of the people on the left think that. Other people on I the like right I like America in the 40s. You know, where everybody well, could, you know, I liked capitalism when it was just starting to grow and develop. Like, mm -hmm. if I was an artist right now, because the capitalist model for me as a small-time person, because, you know, I've made hats in the past, and I've yeah, always yeah. been interested. You're still in making them, aren't I'm you? I'm still making them, not as much. What a chapeau. Around a chapeau. That's yeah. right, Clayton <laughs> Caps. But um, I like the idea that the person has the opportunity and the possibility to work their way up the ladder. I think the place like where that, that, where that model yeah. exists right yeah, now, yeah, yeah. I think, if I was a kid, I would go to China. Okay. Because things there aren't stabilized. You know, the problem with the money is, and, and with the power, and you're absolutely right, I agree with you, it gets mm. to this point where you have these corporations and they run and dominate everything. Everything. Yeah. Everything. Mm. And that's wrong and it's bad and it's worse than communism. Mm -hmm. You know, they have the both. Really worse than communism. Yeah, in worse its own way, Stalinism. of course. Yeah, okay, yeah. Well, we're not, let's, we're not throwing names around right now. Yeah. We're talking about ideas, but... Um, yeah, I think that, um, you know, I would go to China because, you know, when you have that possibility to really go somewhere and to grow and to develop without that sort of, you know, power structure like a huge corporation monitoring everything in the background, things mm. are really going to grow. I think, mm. I think China is where the, uh, where the real development, the creativity and the genius is going to come. Well, there you go. China is going to be like America in the 40s. If you look back at America, the greatness... You know, look, look, look at what developed in, in, in New York City in the 40s and 50s and yeah. 60s. Look oh, at yeah. the music, the oh. art, the, the, oh. the writing, everything. That was a growing country, and we were absolutely great. Yeah, we had you a look few, at it now, had, and there's nothing. We had, we, it, 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 we had a few decades there after the Second War where things were Definitely. really swinging, uh, and, every, and, and things were really going in a different kind of way, and something's changed. And that's where China is now. Yeah, what happened you is... You think China is there? Oh, yeah, I think that that's to me would be the exciting I place. saw recently... I mean, I we're mean, living in the insane asylum now. You know, well, at, okay, okay. I don't really care about the Mexicans coming into the country because mm. in reality, the Mexicans aren't taking the jobs that most people want. Yeah. The real, that's almost like shifting the focus. It's almost like every, getting everybody looking at the Mexicans and yeah. pointing to the Mexicans. Uh -huh. But the reality is, what about the, uh, the, uh, the exporting of all the jobs? You know, you, get, you go to the doctor now and he's going to read your x-rays. Uh, they're being read in India. It's because there's lower costs in India. They can and realize you can do the that with the computer. Gain. Yeah. You can do it immediately. Yeah, you right. know, the, you, with the computer, you don't you, can, you don't have to be in the next room. You can be in the next country. You can right. be across the ocean. Right. That's not the Mexicans taking those jobs. Mm -hmm. Those are middle class jobs and upper middle class jobs mm -hmm. that people were like technicians and people like that. You call up your bank now. You're talking to somebody in India. Mm -hmm. So we're exporting all of those kinds of jobs. We're yeah, the middle that's class and downsi above. They we're downsizing. We're downsizing. Yeah, we did that. Yeah. The dollar is going down in value. It's worth it half of what it was. Yeah. Not, is it not, not half? Well, okay. Yeah. So it was like, what was it, a dollar yeah. sixty-three or uh, something okay. to the euro? Yeah, so okay, yeah. not okay. quite half, but yeah, you yeah, know, it's yeah. a big You're chunk. Right. And we got huge debt to China. And we can't even paper. make uh, dog food and toothpaste anymore mm -hmm. because that's being made in China. Yeah. So now we've we've uh, you know in this downsizing, we're making dog food in China. Mm -hmm. We're making toothpaste in China. Mm -hmm. You know, the pharmaceuticals making those little pills. It isn't like the, that greed factor is that there's there's they're making so much profit anyway, mm -hmm. and it costs so very little to make those pills, mm -hmm. but now it costs nothing to make them in China. Mm -hmm. You know, Harold, when you and I were growing up, mm -hmm. all of the uh, the cheap imported souvenirs and things came from Japan. That's right. Remember Japan? Yeah. So they were inexpensive to buy. That's right. Right? Yeah. I remember. Okay, so now they're making They were also very well engineered, a lot of like electronics. Everything you'll notice in this studio is Japanese made. Yeah, and they built themselves up in the yeah. motorcycles, the Honda, yeah, and whatever. Right. Automobiles. Maybe. Automobiles, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what happened is, is that um, it went to the Pacific Rim. They used to, to say the, the future is Japan. Now they say the future is China. But the point is, yeah. those cheap things that came out of Japan were cheap. They're cheap to make in China, no. but it costs the same price as to have it made in America. Mm -hmm. When you go and buy a pair of sneakers, they cost you like 125, 130 dollars, whatever. They cost. Nothing. They cost as much as it costs the Japanese to make a souvenir. And they're made with slave labor, by and large. There's a lot. 85,000 demonstrations in well, China, despite the uh, very heavy clampdown by that uh, so-called socialist system they got over there. They got gated communities. People I'm interested going in, in America. They get, they're gentrifying there. Of course. And China. But, but and my the point people is, well, are China not being served. I don't know what's happening in China, but uh, okay. you know, I, I think that's where the new creativity is. 
But my point about this is I'm worried about America. You're looking at the creativity coming out of China in terms of art? But let's get back is to there that. Is coming out of let's, China? Let's get back to that idea. Okay. Why is it that uh, those sneakers and those products are you know, made so cheaply but cost so much here? Why didn't we just make those in America and sell them for the same price? Because the margin of profit and the greed is so huge. Mm -hmm. And that's all that it's about. We know that the people in charge stop caring about the people below. There's well, no connection. I don't know that they ever have, really. I mean, I don't think the emperor is luxuriating in the empire, you know, in, the, uh, in, the, in the great villas of uh, Rome and environs and so forth, and cared much about the serfs. And I don't think the royal families in their powdered wigs in the castles cared about the serfs. No, and but I don't the think the leaders who are now care much about the people at all, and it's just a, we have an election campaign. But once there's in a, a while. difference. There's okay. a difference. And the input to production, one of the things. The oligarchy, let me just finish that one okay, point that you were talking about. The oligarchy always was always within the oligarchy. In America, the person who moved up the ladder was connected to the bottom because he started on the bottom. Mm, a lot no, of people who achieved. Uh, algae type stuff, yeah. But that's what it was. Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, who look at the greatness of all of those people that we described before? All mm -hmm. of that creativity, all of that greatness. Those those people came from uh, came from cheap rent and inner cities and places like that. A lot of them did, didn't a they? A lot of them did. Yeah, but so then once you get money, then money makes money and it gets well, very comfortable. But it if takes you've two or three money. generations before you get to that point. Right. Where and that people total would do disconnect that. Would, has. And then they had the work ethic. If you work hard and you keep your nose to the right. grindstone, you'll be able to benefit and so forth. Right. But it's getting to the point where. Horatio Alger's was a myth in terms of the story, but of there was a reality uh, uh, connected to... And the racism in the 19th century against Chinese, against the blacks, it was always there, chattel slavery, right. a lot of history. James there, is, Joyce, there is no utopia James on Joyce, earth. There is oh, no utopia. Well, there's there's that no heaven be, on earth. There well, is no heaven on earth. Well, all right, but that's not a thing, I think. Has that got to do with the nature of the universe? Has it got to do with it's bad... got to do with the changing of America, which is what we're talking changing about. Changing of the world. The ch well, the changing of the world. We're, we're but going let's through stick a huge... To America. You want to stick to America and to the Lower East Side? It doesn't have to be the Lower East Side, but I would like well. to bring back the jobs here. I would like to bring the economy back to here. Mm -hmm. I would like to bring, uh, you know, production, everything back to here. I mean, well, since we're paying for the same price, why not make it here? Well, okay, that's a good thing, except, right, uh, we used to have, uh, at the turn of the 19th, 20th century, the single most important occupational uh, role for a family was a family farm. Second was domestics. And now what's happened is you got all this industrialization and you got tremendous growth and um, we could feed the world from Ka from Kansas practically and we got all this kind of thing and you only got 2% less than 2% of the population taking care of that and then the people went to the factories in uh, Detroit and they were able to uh, the people did Correct. and now what's happening Lord Keynes weren't were warned about it through his grandchildren in 1930 you're going to have economic you're going to have technologically induced economic unemployment that there are going to be the, the labor input, I think America is as fragile now to, as Russia no, was no, when it the collapsed. World, the world. The, it, it's beyond the outsourcing and beyond that is that the input to production in terms of a labor return, that's how much you get back for what you do, is now uh, one where it's not going to be able, it's going to be displaced, you're going to have a tremendous productive capability, but you're not going to need the people to do it. Autonomic right. systems, all this kind or of thing, and the assets, exporting. which are increasingly responsible for production, maybe 90% of the actual output of the modern economy of the United States as a mentor economy, has nothing to do with any human activity at all, except we focus well, the guy, on the that. guy running it. No, but no, you, no, 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 how many he's people, pushing the button to start the machine. How many people do you know are connected out? to their own economy and their own income? There's practically very Almost few. Almost none. See, I used to make caps. Yeah. So I was directly connected to what I made in terms of my uh, economy and my product. Mm -hmm. So it was one-to-one. -one. Yeah. I mean, how many one-to-ones do you know now? Well, anymore? on the family farm, it used to be one-to-one. And the one. family farm used to be one-to-one. Then one you got one. Mr. Ford with the assembly line, great, right. it, and you got... But the family Adam farm, Smith you said it can feed all of Kansas, could feed all of America. Well, well that's I don't know. probably true. The, the, but why United is it that we're importing all, all of this the food? They could, import, they could feed the world. They could, but why uh, are we, we importing all this food? Well, because we don't have adequate... Uh, we, because, if you want to ask me why, <laughs> what the problem is, is we're stuck, both intellectually and so forth, with this labor theory of value. And for the vast majority of the people, the way they have to get income to pay rent is out of touch with the way things are being produced. Because they're distributing there all income We're back to, to the, the rent again. Right, to the rent. Yeah, they're distributing survival. income to them by their right. job, 
on those those right. those those uh, those factor those and systems. Let me ask you another question. What would happen if we turned off the electricity? How many people and how much? Absolute utter disaster. Be complete disaster. Absolute, Absolute disaster. Complete disaster. We could not live without electricity. We couldn't Thank live without you, electricity. Mr. Edison. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've based our whole society under that. We're, we've lost our independence in every way. Mm -hmm. In every way. Well, we you, know, you go to it. Europe, at least you go to Germany, all these people, they all have little gardens, mm -hmm. you know, may, might not be right where their home is because they're all living here. You know, the, they've worked this society, like we say, oh, the people say, oh, well, in Italy they're paying, uh, you know, $7 for gas or for a liter or whatever. They so, do, yeah. It's yeah, really the reality yeah, is yeah, they've built taxes. their whole system up. Yeah. To survive yeah, they also that way. get health care and they also get education. You got guys they running around in mopeds. Mm. The whole uh, uh, transportation system is geared yeah. for that. That whole society is geared for that seven dollar a liter uh, price. Well, it's adjusted to it over a long period. We're yeah, just getting we're not that adjusted now. to it at all. No, yeah, and they're, and they're pushing we've had cheap energy. Yeah. We've had cheap energy, we and we still to, should have cheap we energy. We may get to a point where it's going to be. Not, it may be get to the point where they're going to have to liberate mankind from the constrictions that have kept the societies in order. That's what I think. I think it may be on a positive side. We may be at a time of absolute liberation because we have a capability, a technologically augmented capability to provide for everyone and the ecology that our inherited systems won't let us do right. because we're, we're, we've got outdated notions of economic theory. I don't dispute that. But you don't uh, dispute that? No. Well, it's a but, big question. I but mean, the thing is, is that um, I could see America collapsing very easily. I think that we're on the, the verge. World? We're, not the world? world? Not you the world. I don't see the world. I, I oh. see Russia building itself up. Mm -hmm. I see China building itself up. I see Europe getting stronger. And I see America lost and, and wallowing in, in mindlessness. Yeah. Is there, is there, is Whether it's a Dollar, the, you know, and you just start looking at, you know, we're, we're importing food, we're importing dog food, we're importing everything, and mm. the dollar's going down. Yeah, I mean, we're uh, we're in a, we're in a place of almost collapse. I uh, I think we're as vulnerable Running as Russia was deficits, when the you know, yeah. huge deficits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huge. Way beyond even the Republicans. Way beyond their means. Way yeah. beyond their means. Uh huh. Uh huh. You know, all this money that's coming out of Halliburton and Dubai and like, you know, I mean, where's that? Where's that money going? It's not coming back to America. Mm -hmm. They're not paying taxes on that. Yeah, and that money, th those bonds are all being held by China. Chinese, they could pull the rug out from any time they wanted to if yeah. they wanted to do that. Or, or the Arabs. Their power. Or the Saudis. Or the Arabs. Yeah, that's yeah, absolutely. right. We're into we are vulnerable. Uh -huh. We are stupid. Well, Fareed Hello? Zakaria, Fareed Zakaria <laughs> has a book out now about the you know post-American empire times. And that what you have three, you have China, and you have Europe, and you have the United States. We're still a power, a major power, maybe major economic power, a major political and even military power and all that sort of thing. But it's 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 got uh, other countervailing counterbalancing. You know the other thing, Harold, we've power, lost yeah. our conscience. Mm -hmm. You know, under Bloomberg, who I see is yeah, who, back who's, to New York. Yeah, yeah, he's awful. I think he's he, he's he, he's much more sinister than uh, than Giuliani. If really? I, if I look think? at Lower East Side and the things that have happened, mm -hmm. you know, like there's a person called uh, the Economakis uh, family. That's 45, 47 East Third Street. They belong to like this this uh, shipping magnate family from Greece. They're uh -huh. extremely wealthy. Yeah, they took over a five story tenement with mm -hmm. rent-stabilized apartments in it, with uh -huh. people that had spent their whole life growing up in those apartments. Mm -hmm. and, and there are 15 apartments in those two buildings, and they're kicking out all of those people mm -hmm. in order for this one man and his wife and his two infant children to own the whole building as a mansion. Mm -hmm. That's a tenement building, Harold. Mm -hmm. Not a brownstone in East 61st Street. Mm -hmm. It's a tenement on the Lower East Side. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, it's legal to do it, and I accept the fact that it's legal right. because the landlord is allowed to take one space for himself, and this greedy person wants to take the whole, whole space. building, take the whole. Now, under away. Bloomberg and this, legally, it's correct, and the law is always kind of uh, you know, if you're smart enough, the you law it favors the rich. The law favors Always. anybody who can twist it around yeah. to its favor. Law, right. law is a flexible thing. If it you have is, the right yeah. imagination, whether mm. you're rich or not, you can twist things around. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've sometimes worked it myself. But the point <laughs> is, yeah. is that morally and ethically it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And you see with the Bloomberg administration and his kind of mentality, and that guy made himself a billion dollars, and you wonder, how do you get a billion dollars without taking money from somebody? You've mm -hmm. got to get take a lot of money from a lot of people to well, get a billion dollars. how do you accumulate dollars. capital at all without taking something from well, somebody? Well, there you go. So he's taking a lot of dollars from a lot of little old ladies and a lot of other, other people. Mm -hmm. But the point is, is when it gets to the, when that's morally and ethically wrong. 
Well, it's and always been like that, though. No, it hasn't it? always when been like that. When wasn't it like that? Well, was there a president you can identify? Or somebody would know it was John Harold, Kennedy? I can identify under Kennedy or any other president, mm -hmm. a person could live in a tenement building and be somewhat secure in having a home. You're right. In when a person can take yeah. over a whole tenement building, that means every building in the city that's a tenement building or a building like that that's owned by a private landlord mm -hmm. is vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe you couldn't go up to a 16-story building and say, I want this whole building for myself. Or because 30 that would be Rockefeller ridiculous. Plaza. Or 30 Rockefeller Plaza. Mm -hmm. But any five-story tenement in the city, you could do that too. Mm -hmm. That's morally and ethically wrong. That has crossed a line that, n that has never happened before in America. Mm -hmm. when, never. Did we, when, when did we get to the point where we crossed the line from what had been to what is becoming? Well, in this in this negative direction, you from see. my perspective, I see it started in, a, in about 1980, Mr. Reagan. Yeah, yeah, about mid 1980. Or so yes. since the Second World War, 45 to 80. Well, the Second World War was a growth period, and things were you know there was kind of that that positive spirit yeah. that went with that. There yeah. was sharing and growth and mm -hmm. development and mm -hmm. kind of. You know, Europe had to rebuild, Japan had to rebuild, right. all that, yeah, and everything. But and now once this whole greed factory is just, you know, out of control. Oh, well, okay. That's and like Bloomberg, why did he want to build the, the uh, stadium in, the, in, in, that, uh, in that last tenement area almost in downtown, is, yeah. uh, you know, in the west side over there? Mm. Because that would have gutted all of those people. All of those people would have been moved out, displaced. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, if you still go over to, uh, you know, behind where the... Uh, you know, Port Authority and that is. You yeah. know, there's still tenements over there. There's uh. still Hispanics living over there. Uh. It still has an inner city quality. Yeah. Had he gotten his way mm -hmm. with that MTA building, mm -hmm. and he's, you know, he tries every angle possible, mm -hmm. that is going to clean that out, and mm -hmm. that's his purpose in the end. Mm -hmm. His purpose it's a form in the of gentrification. End, yes. And yeah. what is gentrification in the end? Because I've documented my well, neighborhood. Well, some people say it's making improvements. We're getting things better. We're getting rid of the old and bringing in the new, and we're going to build be beautiful new modern buildings. Oh, and they are. Yeah. And they are. But and the it's progress, they would say, yeah. And in their eyes, it is. Yeah, yeah. But the reality is, is that it's displacing the people. I'm not talking, you know, what the problem with talking about the people mm -hmm. is that everybody makes the assumption that it's the down and out and the people that have nothing and the guy struggling on the bottom. Lot of We're talking about everybody yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not talking Teachers, about the yeah. people. Mm -hmm. We're talking about us. Mm hmm and that's the problem with these terms. Is, oh, yeah, okay, well, now we're talking about the people. Well, right. who are the people? Yeah. Let's forget the mm. sort of connotation that Well, you've with been dealing name. with a lot of that on the Lower East Side. And you've yes. taken how many thousand photographs have you got in your archive? Over a million. Over a million? Over a million. He's taken photographs of everybody in the Lower East Side. Everybody well, knows him. I mean, and I could go through my bag right now. I, I know, I know. All kinds we of got all kinds of... You're, you're always taking pictures always taking and everything. Pictures. And you got, he's right. down on S6 Street, and he's got a place that is so vibrant and so forth. His wife, Elsa, and the two dogs. you got two yeah, dogs. Two dogs. So it's a real important place. Now, all of this talk about the world, and we've got to get to it. We're not talking about the world. First of all, we're talking about... Uh, we're talking about oh, all right, you're tying it in. But yeah. anyway... Uh, we got a piece of a DVD we want to show. We do. And also, we do. You, the books you've been writing, you, and you, did you say a 2,300-page uh, um, book on the Jewish uh, presence uh, in right. Lower East Side? Mm -hmm. What a major book. you got some of Dorothea Lange's photos or photos and so forth. Not really a photo. They, these are more word, but what I'm trying to do is preserve history. You're writing it yourself or no, editing? No, they're editing. It's, yeah. They're anthologies. Okay, right. And so That's have really a important. For the, so with How the, are with you the on three books, Are you well along? 2,500 yeah, words? Finished, almost finished 2, that 2,500 pages, yeah, you have said? a good memory, Harold. That's a major, major it's operation. It's been a That's huge like the amount of work. the Britannica. I'd like to eventually, I could see. Are you going to pictures there's no, no, There's no money for it. There's no support for this. That's I'm the trouble. There isn't money for the things that really matter. The works of civilization no. are not well supported. No. It's always things that have to do with My archive means nothing. Uh huh. It Dang. means nothing. Yeah. Well, it does in the longer sense. You and I understand the meaning of it. Mm -hmm. There's nobody out there that uh, else that does. That There's nobody supports what it is that I do either for the archives, yeah. for the photographs, for the videos, for the books, none of it. First two books are 600 pages each. They're pretty. Yeah. They're not bad anthologies. Mm -hmm. They're anthologies, they're yeah. not, which I, I gather the get together the people to yeah. uh, to write. But and, they're really and good. Edit. They're really good. Yeah. It's a it's a huge amount of work. Yeah. 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 And it's work that is not given enough attention, and the arts are not it's given not given enough any attention. attention. They're not given. Poor Mr. Van Gogh painted all those paintings. One of them they used to. Poor put Mr. It Van Gogh had a had a well off brother that took care of everything. And to be well, if everybody had a well off brother, right. then people would be able to do what they want rather than That's what right. they dictate they must do in order to fit and uh, right. make three million, three thousand dollars a month to pay 
for a studio and apartment. And you bring up an important point there, mm. Harold. Do what you want. Yeah. You see, that whole well, that's idea... that's subversive in the minds of a lot of people. You do what you're told. Of America, that's what the educational system is teaching you. Do what you're told by an authority figure. Now, when Get did ready that for the happen? Army. When did Get that ready happen? for the corporate when did cubicle that happen? job. We know that that... <laughs> We know that that's anti-American. Mm. We know that the whole idea it's of the human. It's a, well, it's also anti-human. Mm. But we know that the whole idea of the individual, and and basically, I mean, what do you say, pulling up yourself by the bootstraps yeah, or whatever. Yeah, well, that's a racial algebra. Yeah. But you know, the but the whole idea of the individual, you could always be an individual in America, and America always pushed the individual idea. Yeah, they did. Now they're pushing the corporate thing. You know, the Britney Spears, the Madonnas. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, it's it's these images, well, we, these corporate images, even with like graffiti people in that now. They 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 take them in, they give them a thousand running shoes to design for Nike, and all of a sudden these guys are making a thousand running shoes, and those thousand running shoes are gone, they're gone, that's it. And they're just sort of co-opting all of this street culture. Well, maybe we're just a couple of old timers who are saying, we I are. don't know what this younger generation is coming to. They've been saying that ever since Cro-Magnon caves, I think, because well, these young people you come along and they an just don't trust the traditional tried and true values that we lived by. Maybe it's just we're getting on in years. Well, we are, and, <laughs> yes. and, and I'm lucky enough to look back, but, yeah. though, but those people cannot follow what I did. Uh -huh. They cannot do what I did. Uh -huh. it's I not see possible. that opportunity is often. That opportunity is of finished. Individual so import. I might be an old guy looking back and sitting here playing my you're violin and yet. saying, you're no, getting I'm not, there, I'm but getting I'm here there. to tell but you But I might be playing my uh, violin and yeah, talking right. about the yeah. good old days. Mm. They cannot follow and do what I did. Mm -hmm. It is not yeah. possible. Yeah, those doors are being closed. That door is closed. Okay, let's talk some specific. Okay, let's talk another specific. I was very, very, you know, I'm, I'm so fortunate in another way is that yeah. I had three young guys, mm -hmm. uh, Ben Solomon, mm -hmm. uh, Dan Levin, mm -hmm. and Jenner First, three mm -hmm. kids that grew up in New York City, three mm -hmm. kids that came from creative families. Yeah, creative, you know? thank you. Yeah, yeah. and like, uh, you know, Ben's father writes poetry yeah. and... and, and uh, Society you know, doesn't uh, care about prints poetry. Books, you ever try to sell a uh, book of poetry? Well, he prints books. Yeah. And... and, and uh, uh, Dan Levin is a third generation uh, New York City filmmaker. Allen Ginsberg once said, if I could live by, on my poetry, I could go in and get my food and sustenance with my poetry. This would be a good society, but it's impossible. Well, he's Except not the best example. He's one of the only... Because he happened he, to he make He happened it, yeah. to be the only poet yeah. probably in America that yeah, was able to survive what it is. <laughs> yeah, right. So he's not the best example. But he could do that or because he lived on 12th and Street and off Avenue A and yeah, he had know, cheap he rent. Yeah, right down there, yeah. Cheap rent again. So yeah, he, yeah. Could be a, a, he could survive by his poetry because he did have cheap rent. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Couldn't be Allen Ginsberg again. Yeah, yeah. It's finished. Right. So these three young guys, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Ben Solomon, Dan Levin, and Jenner First, mm -hmm. um, you know, I met them, uh, well, Ben and Dan, when they were in high school. They were making a film, mm -hmm. and I, I knew the uh, mother of one of the kids that they hung out with. And you knew all the filmmakers, you know, Jonas Makis and all that. You know? Yeah, and yeah, Jonas. You, you couldn't filmmakers. do Jonas Mikas again mm -hmm. either. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so uh, the point is, is that they were they went to Cuba and made this film c about Cuban hip hop. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to uh, write a little review for them mm -hmm. and got into mass appeal. And mm -hmm. I really admired what they did. Yeah. But out of you know. All the people that have been through my place, uh -huh. these yeah. three uh, kids at the time, yeah. understood what I was doing. Uh -huh. Out of everybody, uh -huh. everybody, and I have photographed a lot of people. A lot you of people sure have, have seen my stuff. A I mean, million. I've been well known for yeah. like the riot tape, yeah, right, right. and all of that. Mm. They're the three people, the only three that actually understood what I've been doing. And you've been, what is you, you, in your own words, you've been doing. Well, I'm an artist, and I document the Lower East Side, and I'm documenting the changing culture and well, what it is that's going on. Well, I think more people understood that in that general term that you just well, said. Well, they're the only ones that came what around and did something. They, what okay. is it that they did? They, they made a film. They made a film. They okay. made a film. Of you. Of me. Now, I've had people, you know, Hollywood come Oh, that's come the film by. captured? That's the film captured Good. the movie. show a little clip, yeah. So I've had people, you know, that, that worked in Hollywood. I had a guy who was a director of Morton Downey, mm. you know, big TV people. They came through my place, and they always got lost in the volume of material. Right, right. These three young guys mm. came in, and they created this movie, and I think it's a great movie. Now, it's interesting because the movie's been rejected by Tribeca and all of these places yeah. because that's like the establishment. Yeah. And when I look at the establishment now, like if I look at, uh, like, let's take two people from that so establishment of Tribeca. Let's everywhere take, you look, it's kitsch. Let's, uh, well, it's not all kitsch, but, no, let, but let's look at Robert, Robert De Niro and let's look at uh, Scorsese because they're, mm. they're part of Tribeca and yeah, they're from yeah, the downtown sure. film people. Yeah. 
So Scorsese and these guys, so he's doing movies on Rolling Stones, mm. you know, like the Rolling Stones need more uh, attention, and that's like, that's like the millionaires taking care of the millionaires. <laughs> well, they always and, have, and believe De Niro, me. And De Niro is doing Hollywood. Mm. De Niro grew up, he couldn't have been that, that, that rich when he grew up. His father mm. was an artist, a struggling mm. artist, so uh -huh. he grew up with cheap rent. Scorsese grew up in Elizabeth Street, mm. and these guys now, that they're the rich, the guys in charge, they're not bringing up the next generation. These are three kids that grew up in New York City, and the establishment is not bringing them in. I'm not no. talking about me now, the old guy playing the guitar or whatever in the corner. You don't play guitar, do you? No, I'm using that as mm. the, the yeah, idea, of, you know. Yeah, metaphor. Yeah. Uh, but... Uh, you play a camera. Yes, I play a camera. <laughs> <laughs> But they were, they were able to come in, in out of all of this work mm. and actually weave out what I think is a very good movie. Okay, that's good. Let's do that. Be, let's talk about it. It's called Captured, It's called right? Captured the Movie. Captured the Movie. Now, the interesting and thing is... one of is, the things that we're going to run out of time if we're not okay, careful right. because there's only so many times... In, there's all so right. many all right, let's get to the elements right. within a 60-minute program. You're right. And we got a ca uh, thing. We got it on DVD. And, George, if you could set it up... I guess about three minutes or so, a kind of trailer yeah. for the captured movie. Yeah, it's true. And we're talking on a day tomorrow night. This is the 21st of August. Tomorrow, 22nd. Too late. It's going to be aired already. I mean, it will have happened when this airs. But we're going to be. Uh, it's going to be shown downtown right? at the Bowery. Uh, Festival at Seward Park High School. 1,700 people. That's a lot of people. That's humanity. a lot of people. That's a lot yeah. of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was 35 and under. Okay, that's so, good. Okay. So they understand. All right, they that's understand. good. There may be that. Okay, well, George, maybe hope. we could set that up in the studio and run. We're talking with Clayton Patterson, documentarian extraordinaire. Here we go.
Okay, well, we played play a little bit over again so you can see it again and everything. That was really good. Now, that film's going to show tomorrow as we sit and talk now downtown, and it's done. How long is the film? Uh, about 87 minutes. 87 minutes, and it's about you. Feature. It's about uh, you. Uh, myself in the archives. Some, oh, oh, wonderful. Somebody's finally taking attention to that. I think that's marvelous. Is it going to be distributed in the stores and that kind of stuff, or is yeah, it eventually. word of mouth? It will eventually, you right? No, I have uh, total faith in these uh, three young guys. I think yeah. they're really great. I think mm. that, um, you know, it's tough for them now because they're having a real problem. You know, after the uh, film was made and we showed it to those 1,700 people, you yeah. know, they had to immediately get back to work and find a job. And they got a job making another film, which they mm. got paid for. Mm -hmm. But that took away from them trying to promote this. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, myself, uh, you know, and, my, and a friend of mine, Billy Leroy, mm. you know, we played it at Webster Hall mm. and we yeah, did it right. at other places. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, they have to now make money to pay the rent. So, mm -hmm. But I, I have total faith in it. I think they did an excellent job. I think that we'll find an audience and it'll eventually get out there. Very good, and yeah. I'm very happy with what they did. I think that they're really, really, I just, you know, hope that they can survive in the city and keep going. Because right, right, right. Very talented. They put very it talented. And they put it together with Final Cut or something? Or how yes. did they do it? They did well, it. Well, actually, their See, they can has do it. Studio. It's getting down to where you can do it on the laptop. Well, now. they were lucky. Like I say, Dan Levin is a third generation filmmaker. His All father, right, Mark right. Levin, just finished a movie called Mr. Untouchable, which uh -huh. is also a really great movie. Mm. It's one of the only movies you'll actually see a real gangster talking because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they had um, uh, Mickey Barnes. But, uh, you know, and then he did uh, Elders of Zion. And his father's right. made a lot of really incredible documentaries. Right, okay. So the father has a studio, Blowback Productions. Okay, good. And yeah. the boys' production is called uh, Ben vs. Dan. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they had the facilities because they grew up. And they both, they, they, all three of them went to, uh, to filmmaking school. They right, to, right, uh, right, to right. Boston University, I think, somewhere like and that. And people so. are picking it up. And the, and, and the, the youth are picking it up. The, fi the youth are picking it up. This usually they do and everything. And the, and the f uh, ability for an individual, there might be somebody with really good chops that you're just sort of naturally born into his consciousness I mean, out there in Ames, Iowa. And he can put together clips and things. He can take things off the Internet. And there's a great creative output. And it doesn't take a great deal. It doesn't take a great deal of money to do that like it used to do to set up, what you the, know. One uh, of the only independent we only had art forms. Film, we only had 35 millimeter film in the days of MGM and that sort of thing. But now filmmaking is becoming part of the available resource base, even for people that are not very well uh, There's two you know, things. Set. There's two things. It's I mean, democratized. I've, I've, I've been a, a judge of a number of festivals, including... Yes, I know actually, I was just finished uh, being a judge of the Hamptons uh, Student Festivals, which okay. is graduate and undergraduate. Right. And I would say 10, 15 years ago, almost everything would be like NYU and maybe Columbia and yeah, Cal right. Arts. Right. What you have now is, is that you're absolutely right about that. Right. You have uh, Iowa, we had Savannah, right. we had Hungary, mm -hmm. and, and because it was so expensive before, you, you know, it cost you a couple hundred thousand dollars to do a student film. You know, yeah. That's why NYU, you would have that kind of, uh, you know, yeah. people had that kind of potential. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the lighting and the sounding and all this extra equipment. Now with this digital, you know, factors coming mm -hmm. in, you can do it with a much, you know, fewer people and readily available equipment. Would you, would you think about putting it up on something like Blip or, T or YouTube or something like that and making it archivable, available to the whole wide world at no cost? Or is there some way to do that without being concerned with the cost? If you can make a thing, like here at Public Act, you can make programs here, and there's no cost. Well, let's talk about there's two, no let's talk about two art forms. Let's talk about two art forms where you can be anywhere in the country and do it. So we know now that people in film, mm -hmm. because of the uh, availability of equipment, mm -hmm. are making great films. The other thing, which is really interesting, is tattoos. Okay. You know, a lot of yeah, people went to art that. school. You have been, yeah. Yeah, this movie doesn't deal with that part mm. of this subject, but part of the archives. But mm. yeah, I've documented a lot of tattoos. Mm. And a lot of people went to art school, and then they want to be painters and artists and, yeah. and like that. And there was nowhere where you could be in Iowa or Kansas or even New York City, really, and have access into the system where you could actually support yourself by your artwork. So what happened is a lot of people then got involved in tattooing because you had to be able to draw well by the time you got into You mean painting. to do the art of tattooing somebody else, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Or is so that you, you yeah, can I now guess. find people... You can find really great tattoo artists anywhere in America. Yeah, they have been to a couple of your things where they're yeah. just uh, giving, uh, judging so the quality of, of it as art. Yeah. The idea, which you keep on saying Horatio Algiers, and I disagree, but mm. at, at one time, now it's possible to survive even, you know, fairly well 
as an independent person, as a tattoo artist. I wonder, is it important that people... And that's a job are, that you can't make too corporate and you can't do it with machine. Uh, okay. You need the human touch. Okay. So that's one of the few places in America where you can actually now be a creative individual mm -hmm. and be self-sufficient. Uh, because as an artist, one of the things you want to be is self-sufficient. Uh, well, as a human being, what you want to be is self-sufficient. It would be good I do. if you I do. do. I do. And I think Not a everybody good does. deal... I do. Okay, that's Should be interesting. A choice. You don't think everybody would if they could? Let's no. say I think a lot of people could, need the security. I think a lot of people need the big. Well, well no, no. But if you're self-sufficient, you would have a good deal of security taken care of. If you were truly, I do. I e do. No. Okay, you're talking to yourself. Right. But if an individual human being was self-sufficient in terms of their needs or whatever it is or want, reasonable wants, and that would take a great a great deal of the angst that there is existed within the world. I think if, I think there's a, only a small percentage of the people that really have that sort of. Desire. You think it is. I you really think do. that people want to live under duress Most and people. having to yeah, duress, having serious. to do what? No, I, I'm serious. Is I'm that, serious too. Is that is that is it possible that there could be a world where everybody would be able to be doing what it is they really want to do rather no. than what some uh, taskmaster no. insists they do and dissuade them from the things they think are important. They could be dealing with the things they think they're important and have the wherewithal they could lead that way without being unduly um, uh, 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 traumatized or poverty made poverty by having that kind of an attitude in the world. My that is a liberated attitude My toward. experience in life, mm -hmm. taught high school one time, taught college one time, mm -hmm. you know, I've done a lot of independent things in New York City. My experience is most people want to be told what to do, most people need to be told what to do, and most people need direction. By human nature. By it's human nature. human nature. That's that what that I find. By human nature, right. that's what they that's want. That's what most people want. Okay, then uh, that's... Very few real people that want to carve out their own path really and do their own thing in the end oh that's a okay that's you a know? certain view of human nature yeah it's you don't think it's built into the institutional structure what no. if somebody wants to uh, no. uh, lounge around and play checkers all day well, let them and they don't want to go down to the factory and stand and turn a nut for eight hours a day they want to stay with their kid or they want to go fishing or they want to go Whatever they hey, want, I want to, to drive do. around a Cadillac convertible with a bunch of chicks. Come on, Harold. I mean, it's just you know. I mean, um, there's a practical side to life as well. You know, if somebody wants to just play checkers all day, you could probably find a way to do that. Mm -hmm. It would be a, a tremendous sacrifice in your own part because you wouldn't be productive at anything other than playing checkers. And maybe you could be a, a great checker player. I mean, there's nothing wrong with playing checkers. Right. But if you have ambitions within the field of checkers, maybe you could find new ways to play checkers. Maybe you could develop new games. Maybe you could develop new players or. You know, but there's right, things the you can do that are creative the goods, the within goods. that and develop yourself, right. you know, an independent lifestyle. In the 50s, you could do that. But you could, you, could separate, uh, you, you could separate the need for what you do to realize money, to live and buy rent. I mean, the idea that you can make money at what you do is something uh, that uh, the opposite of that is if you have enough money for what you need, you won't have to be thinking about making money from what you do. And the one thing that they're trying to do now is whatever you do, you have to be practical and make money, and that's above all else. Your kid might be having a terrible emotional breakdown. you got to get to the job. And that's the thing well, that... Well, yeah, that, but, you, you know, know, I sacrificed. You know, money has never been a big deal in my life. Yeah, you know, usually don't it's have not with artists, yeah. You know, I'm not uh, eating out in restaurants. I'm not buying expensive things. I don't buy expensive clothes. I live a very sort of minimal life. Well, you look pretty well turned out here. I am. Yeah. But, I mean, <laughs> uh, but the fact is, you know, it's a T-shirt and a pair of jeans. Yeah, you can't but go I, but wrong. I look great. Yeah. But the, the reality... And, I'm and a, a chapeau. A uh, nice chapeau. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the, the reality is, is that, you know, I don't have children, uh, you know, um, it made a tremendous sacrifice to leave my individual life. Mm -hmm. And that's a sacrifice I've been willing to make. It's a sacrifice that I'm happy to make. You know, it would be nice to have somebody follow you and whatever, but I don't. And, you know, it's, you have to sacrifice a lot to do these things. Mm -hmm. and for me to be the individual and to continue on well, with I'm my of own the vision opinion and dream, yeah. I was, it's, I'm willing to continue to make and you don't think And you don't think the vast majority of human beings have any vision or dream or anything they just want to do or think that their life is something important experience. outside of what the institutional structures tell them they have to do in order to be responsible? That's uh, like saying, uh, okay, I think we may be, I think we may be at a true. point where we're actually going to be liberating people from that. I don't think people want to be and, liberated. Uh, okay. I don't think uh, people, 
Okay. You know, look, I've I come from Western Canada. I've seen the boom and bust economy. I've seen plumbers out there making this is even years ago yeah, making fifty dollars an hour. They want structure. They got making fifty dollars an hour, and they're making more money. If they would have just collected that money and held it together, they could have done anything they wanted. Well, yeah. what would happen is when the boom was over, they were broke and they had to start over again, and everything they had, the toys and everything else, goes down the toilet and off it goes. Uh, they could have been independent. They could have done a lot of things. Are you po are you opt? We only got a couple minutes left. Are you optimistic for the human prospect? in an age where the weapon systems that exist, they tell us from modeling, are actually species lethal? That is, they could destroy the whole human society, uh, the whole human well, population I don't believe that, first of within all, about a half an hour. You don't think that's correct? No, I don't think it's correct. You don't, don't think I don't that's correct? I don't believe it at okay. all. And, okay. um, but do I think we could be totally self-destructive as a society? Yes, I do. Do I think we, uh, you know, I, I think when they bombed uh, Baghdad, they thought they had the big one and they were blowing off, you know, the Mr. Shock and awe. And, you know, I mean, they're just... It was ridiculous, mm -hmm. and it didn't work. And we, and we don't have the power, and we prove our, our, ourselves over and over and over again not to be uh, that that capable. You know, in our imaginations, we're that capable. You know, if the police were as great as what it is that we imagine them to be on CSI, or I don't really watch those TV shows, mm -hmm. but you know, we would live in a crimeless society. We don't live in a crimeless society. Mm -hmm. We have as much crime now as we've ever had. We have as much drugs now as we've ever had. Nothing has really changed in that way. So if we have this perfection, which everybody is imagining is out there, yeah. our society would be crime-free. We're as far from crime-free free as we ever were. James Joyce had Daedalus say, history is a nightmare from which I'm attempting to awaken. You don't think there's any hope that we will awaken from the history of nightmare, of injustice, inappropriate, wasted lives, and I think so it's possible forth. for a leader and to come around and change things. I think it's okay. possible for a visionary. You know, we need yeah. visionaries. We need philosophers. We need mm -hmm. seers. We need, we need people. We don't have them in our leadership now. Do you see anyone that's George worthy? Oh, well, of, of course. course. I forgot All about right. George. I George. forgot about George, of course. Yeah, of course. Uh, well, it may be Clayton are. Patterson right. and company that might be more in that position. But I, joke, by the way. It's a I have a, a I, I, is that a joke? <laughs> I didn't know, son. You're too young to remember Senator Claghorn, <laughs> right, yeah. on uh, Allen's Alley? We really need leadership. That's what we need. Yeah, we don't have it. Intellectual, have it. intellectual leadership, it would seem to me, and so forth. Could we have I a believe huge economic crash? Could, mm -hmm. I mean... Let, let's take the weapons off the table, mm -hmm. but could we have a, an economic crash that would be as devastating as, as the bomb that you're talking about? Absolutely. Oh. Could we have drought and famine and starving, which is as bad as war? Could we have that? I absolutely agree. Well, that, that, I would agree that, on. That's all true, but I'm sorry, but I do believe that there are systems that we don't even know about and that there are models that it is uh, for the first time, if it's escape, it's a very important thing. That I don't, if there's they no boogeyman I'm, uh, that's out there that I'm afraid to fight, and I'm not going to construct a boogeyman in my head that is impossible for me to approach. Uh -huh. And that's what you're doing, and I don't accept it. Okay, well, that's a, yeah, that's a... The uh, boogeyman is not there for me. You know, I got arrested a week ago for taking pictures on the street. Again? Uh, again. So I'm not into Try that boogeyman. Try to stay man. out of jail, will you please? I'm because the bail fund is running very low. I'm here to tell you. Well, you know? the support factor. So isn't couldn't there you try? And, couldn't you just adjust a little bit and go along with a few of the people that are running society and not be such a rebel? No. I mean, couldn't you just adjust? Couldn't you get your mind straight? No, Luke? I couldn't. Can't you get your mind no, straight? No, I can't. Quit cutting off. No. Parking no. meter heads or something? I don't cut off parking meter heads. Thank God I'm for the art. destructive things. Thank you, Mayor of Lower East Side. Your pleasure of perception, Clayton Patterson, citizen extraordinaire. Thanks a lot for all the work. Watch the movie. See the movie. Captured the movie. And Clayton, thanks for all the work. Love you, Good dearly, luck Harold. on all the books. Love you. My best to Elsa right. and the dog. Absolutely. And all the rest of the people down in that wonderful Lower East Side that you've yes. got such a hand in documenting authoritatively. Okay, tune in again next week. We're coming back. That's it for now. We're going to run the credits, so we're going to have to talk a little bit more now. Yeah, no, and I'm not going to build a boogeyman that's bigger than, that's bigger than I can approach. Well, than I I, can, uh, there, there approach. are models that that's the case. Well, that's that your head, the, not the, mine. No, it's Family not. Starvation. It's not you know what, look no, at you know what the other cut? The, we, the flooding, we the have flooding a, in the Midwest we, this year was, was horrendous. We're not talking about that. No, They're no. Wipe, wiping out cornfields. No, They're wiping out the food belt. You know, our, our money is dropping. Uh, you know, China could pull that back the debt.